Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, as we look at the book of Psalm, Psalm 30, 133, Psalm 133. As we talk this morning about living the dream and relationships devoted to unity, listen to what it says, starting with verse 1. Behold how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded his blessing, even life forevermore. Now look at verse 1 one more time. Behold how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Welcome now to our second week of our brand new series on Live the Dream. You know, Live the Dream is far more than just a series of messages. It is actually all about an ongoing lifestyle. Encapsulated within the word dream is a wonderful and powerful way to live one's life. You see, dream is merely an easy way to remember as an acrostic how to live the Christian life. The D is a dynamic lifestyle of worship. The R is relationships devoted to unity. The E is empowered through biblical training. A is our active ministry involvement and our mission to reach our world for Christ is the M. Now you might be wondering, just how do we ever come up with this concept of dream? Let me tell you how I was born. 15 years ago, I was down at Marquette University. And while at Marquette, I got on an elevator to go up to one of the upper floors, and uh, a young attorney got on board the elevator with me. And this young attorney asked me the question. He says, just, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a pastor. He said, where at? said, Oak Creek Assembly of God, south end of our city. He said, well, tell me, what do you believe? And I started telling him what we believe. And the elevator is going up now, and I'm talking as quickly as I can, trying to inform him as of two, just exactly what do we believe. The door opened on the fifth floor, and the attorney steps out, and he turns around, and he says, let me give you a bit of advice. I thought, okay, I'm always open to advice. What is the advice that you've got for me? He says, if you can't tell me in five floors what you believe, then you don't know. And that kind of stung. I came back to the staff here and I said, listen, we have to come and find a way that we can articulate within five floors of any time an elevator goes up what we believe and why we believe it. And so I commissioned at that time a team that got together and began to study our DNA and the DNA of the Assemblies of God. And we began to compress it all down together so there might be an acrostic, something that would be easily remembered by the D-R-E-A-M. And uh, so that is how the dream was born. And so we have been going through, now this is our second Sunday, looking at our DNA and looking at the dream so that it can remind us once again of what we believe, why we believe it, what are the values that we have here at Oak Creek Assembly of God. And I assure you, if you practice it for a bit, you can get it down so you can stay within five floors on an elevator, all right. So last Sunday then, Pastor John started us out on our series with the letter D, the dynamic lifestyle of worship. In John chapter four and verse 23, it tells us, but the hour cometh, these are the words of Jesus himself to his disciples. He says, but the hour cometh and now is. So he said, you don't have to look for it down the road somewhere. The hour is coming. It's here now when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So last week then, Pastor John began to relate to us God's desire, and God's desire is to have a people that will worship him in spirit and in truth and do so volitionally something that is meaningful, a relationship, and out of this relationship comes adoration and glory towards God. And also, we discovered that man was hardwired from the very beginning in the created time of life. We're all created so that we might be worshipers of God. 
and worship we will. Having just come from a very polytheistic part of the world where they worship millions of gods, and you heard me correctly, millions of gods. I was taken back as we walked over to one day, walked over to one of their temples, huge temple. And on this temple, on the very highest pinnacle, there was two rats, large rats that had been inscribed and then placed on the highest pinnacle. And I watched as people came and they bowed down with their faces to the ground, worshiping a rat. I'm so glad that on the highest pinnacle of our buildings, we have the cross of Jesus Christ. But you see, man is a worshiper, and worship he will. Whether it's a rat, or whether it's the cross of Jesus Christ, and especially the Christ that died upon that cross, worship we will. And so we believe in a dynamic lifestyle of worship. The word dynamic, as you well know, means ever-changing. So we believe we should not be stagnant in our Christian life. We ought not be stagnant in our worship, but it ought to be dynamic. We ought to always be growing in that. You know, there is in the Bible, there is what I call the three-seven rule. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that three times a day will I seek the face of the Lord. It is early morning, noontime, and at night. So three times. But the Psalms also tells us in Psalm 119, 164, it talks about how we should praise God seven times a day. And if you will take and have three times a day where you'll petition God, and seven times a day where you'll praise the name of the Lord God, let me tell you, it will become revolutionary in your life. It will truly become a lifestyle of worship. It will become a style, and it will become more than a style. It will become something meaningful to you and meaningful to God. And so we talked about last week then a dynamic lifestyle of worship, which will keep your life fresh and exciting as a believer and follower of Christ. Now this morning we're going to examine the R, and the R of dream is relationships devoted to unity. Once again, Psalm 133 in verse 1 says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I want you to consider, first of all, the connection. There are some wonderful and unique connections that I think we've all seen historically. For example, in the Bible, we read about the connection between Adam and Eve. God looked upon Adam and said, It is not good that man should dwell alone, so I will make a helpmate for him. And so we automatically, when we talk about Adam, it almost just flows out of our mouth, this team, this connected team, Adam and Eve. We talk about Moses and Aaron. We talk about David and Jonathan. When it comes to the New Testament, we talk about Peter, James, and John. This triplet of names that just kind of flow together because we understand they were directly related one to another in this relationship, or Paul and Barnabas, and you'll read about these in the New Testament. Or what about some other teams? Teams that are from storybooks or, you know, we might even say fictitious kinds of teams. Jack and Jill. Remember, they went up the hill. Amos and Andy, Bert and Ernie, Batman and Robin. I had to throw that one in for my son-in-law. As you all know, he's, he's a Batman guy. And so Batman and Robin. Or if you look at the commercial world, or you look at the corporate world, you'll have couplets that once again, they are they're just part of our nomenclature of the day. It is Sears and Roebuck in the day. It was Black and Decker. It was Baskin and Robbins. It was Proctor and Gamble. And the list would go on and on of those that united together because they believed that together they could do more than they could ever do alone. And so they were great relationships. Some of these great teams were connected then by commerce others by radio, some by television, those that are fictitious. But think about even those from our own U.S. history. Think of Lewis and Clark, 
They were connected by adventure. Or Bonnie and Clyde, they were connected by what? Crime. Now let me ask you this morning, just what is your connection to the person sitting next to you this day? What is your connection to the one that is sitting in the balcony and balcony to the ones that are on the floor? What is the connection between you and this body of believers that are gathered here on this Sunday morning? Look at Psalm 133 and verse one again. Behold how good and pleasant it is for what, say it, brethren. Now the word brethren there is actually a generic term. It is not gender specific in the original uh, Old Testament language there of the Hebrew, but rather refers to family. It refers to those that are connected together. So brothers, and you might even add to it then brothers and sisters, but it says how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So the relationship that we have here as we gather together this morning is one of brethren or being brothers and sisters. We are offspring of the same parents. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the what, say a church? They are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. The Bible tells us God has adopted us into his family. Now there's something about adoption that is very unique as you would take and compare it to natural birth. Adoption, those of you that have gone through the process of adopting a child, you know it's a lot of work to go through all the background checks, the home checks, you know, all the things, all the screenings that go on before you could ever have that child. And so we find here it is a very deliberate act. It is not something that is accidental. It's not something that's just, you know, kind of off the cuff. It is very specific. We have received the spirit of adoption. God adopted us into his family, volitionally. He chose us before the world was ever created. Whereby, the Bible says, because of that adoption, we cry, Abba, Father. And that term, Abba, Father, literally means Daddy. So what we look at, our relationship with God, we look at it not as some distant thing, but as a very enduring kind of relationship, an enduring one, where we say, Daddy, Father, Abba, Father. Now, the verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You can go anywhere in the world, whether it's to Puerto Rico, whether it's down to Brazil this uh, coming summer, or whether it's to Barcelona, as another team will be heading out to Barcelona in July, or if it's uh, you know, our team that's heading off you know, to Asia. All of these places you go, as soon as you find another believer, there's something on the inside that says we have the same father, we have the same bloodline, we have been redeemed by the same person, Jesus Christ. And there is a connection in this family of God, and the connectivity is all around the adoption and the fact that we are part of the same family. And so the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the what? We are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now friends, here's our connection then. Our connection gathered here this morning is the fact we are the sons and the daughters of Almighty God. We are connected to the same Father and that makes us, indeed, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are connected through creation. God is the one that created us. The Bible says we were formed and shaped and created by him while yet in our mother's womb. God's hand was upon our lives. We are connected through creation, and we are connected through redemption. You might say, we are doubly his. There's a story that goes all the way back to the days of children and children's church. And the story goes something like this. A little boy worked so hard on making a little boat. It was a sailboat. 
He worked on it day after day. When he'd get out of school, he would take and go to the garage and he would use his father's tools and he shaped and formed this little sailboat. And the day finally came when he took his boat down to the lake in the center of the city in which he was living. And he placed that little boat down into the water and it was just kind of drifting back and forth when suddenly a gust of wind came, caught the sail of that little sailboat and it suddenly took off out into the deeps of the lake. This little guy tried to retrieve it but could not. The water was too deep, he did not dare swim any further and he assumed that he would be able then to go to the other side of the lake and find his little boat. And so he ran to the other side of the boat, knowing the direction of the wind. And when he got to the other side, he looked through the reeds, he looked through the bay, he looked everywhere, he could not find his little boat. And then as time went by, he went downtown. As he's walking downtown in his little city, he walks by a pawn shop, a pawn store and looked in the window, and what, behold what he saw. In the window was that same little boat, just not any boat, but it was a boat that he created. So he went into the pawn shop, and he said to the owner, that's a boat that I made. That's a boat that I created. I took it down to the lake, and I was trying it out for the very first time and watching it sail. When the winds came and blew it away, and I lost my boat, that's my boat. And the pawn shop owner said, there's only one way that boat will ever be yours, and that is if you buy it. And so the young guy decided he would take and take on little jobs and do whatever he could do. And this little guy, he was mowing lawns and cleaning up things and doing whatever he could do to ask to be able to raise enough money to buy back the boat that he had made. And so finally, having enough money, he went into the pawn shop. He laid the money down, and he bought back his boat. And on the way home, he said, carrying his boat, he says, you're twice mine. First I made you, then I bought you. And that's the story of your life as well. God made you. And then when you were lost in sin far away, he bought you back through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so in this relationship, we have a relationship with God. And this relationship with God brings us in relationship with one another. We are brothers and sisters in this relationship. Being part of God's family is an amazing thing. There's nothing like being part of God's family. However, I think we all know that we're not the only child in God's family. And that's where trouble starts. It's seldom a problem with God. It's oftentimes problems, you know, that are on the vertical, or rather than the vertical, the horizontal. It is our relationships with one another. You see, we are not an only child. We are part of a big family. I would say a very, very big family that reaches all around this world. And we are connected by the fact that God created us, but we're also connected by the fact that God redeemed us. You know, someone has said, and it is so true, you can choose your friends, but not your relatives. And that is especially true in the body of Christ as well. He chose us, places in the body. And we can choose friends, but we cannot choose our relation and our, rel our relatives. My dad would always say to us boys, and once again, just remind you, there's plenty of us to argue with one another and fight with one another, because there was 10 of us boys in the family. And my father would always say to us, brothers do not fight, brothers defend one another. In my opinion, friends, I believe that the church has lost something when we cease calling each other brothers and sister. There was a time, and let me just see by raise of hands quickly, how many remember the day where we called each other brother and sister? Yes, you see hands up all over this room. And we used to identify one another by those designations. It was always Brother John. It was always Sister Teresa. It was always, and we called each other by name. And we would say brother or sister. It was our way of saying we are part of the same family. But as time went by, there was some confusion. Some began to listen to 
believers, followers of Christ, calling each other brother and sister, and they thought we were kind of like monks and monkish, you know, kind of people. And so, and, and, and thinking back to Roman Catholicism and all of that, and so to try to kind of separate from that, the Church of Jesus Christ, for the most part, stopped calling each other brother and sister, so there'd be no confusion as to what that's all about. But I'm afraid that we've lost something along the way. Because there was a time where we would take and not only identify, we understood we were created by God the Father, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and placed into a family, a family so that we might live together, encourage each other, help each other. Family members don't fight. Family members support each other. Family members don't put each other down. Family members lift each other up. When the world's against you, the family huddles together. And the Bible says that God created this family so that when one is rejoicing, have you ever had good news, something's happened to you, and you just couldn't wait to get home to tell your wife or your husband or your family or a friend or someone else, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today. God said, it's going to be so good. What I do is going to be so great. You're going to want to share it, and you're going to want to share it with the family. So I'm going to put you into a family so that when you are absolutely ready to bust with joy, you have someone to share it with that will understand what this is all about. But it'll also be someone that when your heart is broken, when the worst of the worst has happened in your life, you'd have someone to come and be able to share life with and the sorrows of life as well. We're connected. And that connection was the fact that God first created us, shaped us, molded us within the womb. We have one Father, and we have one redemption. That is through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're my brother. You're my sister. We gather together as family. Now, secondly, I want you to consider, what is the duration of this? Is this just for a few moments here on this you know, on this journey towards heaven? And, uh, or is this to be a, a lasting relationship? Look at it one more time. Psalm 133 and verse 1. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to, key words here, dwell together in unity. Now that phrase, dwell together. In the original Hebrew there, it means to settle. Like the settlers of old. Come in and take unknown, you know, territory and, and begin to settle it, which means we're here to stay. When the hard winters come, we're not going anywhere. When the hot summers are here, we're here to stay. It was a settler. It was a settled thing to settle, but it also means to marry, come into a covenant relationship, but it also means to abide. And so the Bible says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to settle together, to marry, have covenant with one another, and to abide together. Friends, we are in this, this body of Christ, this connectivity called the relationship with Jesus Christ and with one another. We're in this for the long haul. You see, this generation has become a generation that has been called the throwaway generation. Relationships and commitments are seen as being disposable. Parents divorce each other. Siblings won't talk to one another. Parents and children are broken off in relationship, and shattered relationships abound. Here's what it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Suppose the whole body were an eye, then how would you hear? Or if the whole body were just one big ear, how could you smell anything? But that isn't the way God has made us. He has made us many parts of our bodies, and he has put each part just where he wants it. What a strange thing a body would be if it only had one part. So he has made many parts, but still there is only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And some of the parts that seem weakest and least important are really the most necessary. You know, there was a time in medical history where they thought that there were spare parts in the body that really were dispendable. They weren't necessary. 
I was raised during the period of time that if you had a sore throat, it wouldn't be long, they would take you to the doctor and they'd take out what? Your tonsils. And I was told by the doctors that once the tonsils are out, you'll never have another sore throat in all your life. Lie. I think he wanted to go on vacation and he needed a little extra bucks to do so. And so his real name, Dr. Peabody, he took out my, my um, what do you call them? Tonsils. <laughs> they say never start a story you don't remember what it's all about. <laughs> and the second point I don't remember, so. Anyway, there was a time in medical history where they thought you could take out various parts of the body and it'd have no effect at all. Now they've realized that every single part, every single organ, everything within the human body was designed by God. It has a specific purpose and cause. There's a reason for it. And though it be removed, there's something missing from that moment on. In this throwaway society, we believe you can just move people out of your life even people that we call brother and sister in Christ, and that there's no ramification to it at all. That we can kind of just vote them off the islands. We can even get a group of friends together and we're going to unfriend the same person. And we have all of these attack modes that are unique, some of them electronic, unique to our day, and others are just the old coarse way of saying, you know, I don't want you in my life, get out of my life, the relationship, he said, how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in ongoing relationship. When things are stressed, rather than running, you work them out. Because we're a family. You can choose your friends, but not your family. And God chose each and every one of us, the Bible says, before the world was ever created, and I am so grateful that he put us into a family. He is the Father. We've been created by God, redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, and how good and pleasant it is for them to settle together, to be in covenant with one another. And that is what the R of dream is all about. It is relationships that are devoted to unity. What about the expectation? So we understand that we've been redeemed, put into a family, and that we're to dwell together in relationship. What is the expectation? Look at Psalm 133 and verse one, one more time. Behold how good. Now that word good is tov, T-O-V, is what we would spell it in uh, the English alphabet. Tov, T-O-V. In uh, Israel, when you greet somebody in the morning, it's boker tov, which means have a good day. Tov, T-O-V, it's interesting, that is the very same word that is used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. When God had created the heavens and the earth, the Bible tells us he stood back and he said, this is very good. And the word that he used is tov. So God, when he looked at his creation, he said, it is good. That's the same word that's used here. Behold how good, the same way that God looked at creation, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters, brethren, to dwell together in unity, to be unified. King David, he is the one that writes and gives us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the words that we've just read out of Psalm 133. Now, if anybody has something to say about unity and about the blessings of a family, either enjoying unity or knowing the pain of disunity, it's this man called David. You see, David knew from personal experience the pain of family division. His own son, Absalom, which many of you know, he attempted a military coup against his own father as an attempt to try to take the kingdom from David by force. Another one of his sons raped his half-sister, Tamar. 
And Absalom became so angry at the fact that Amnon had raped his half-sister that Absalom killed his brother Amnon. Man, you talk about dysfunction. Have you ever looked at the Bible and said, you know, these people are so perfect, I can't live up to all of this? Then you ain't been reading the Bible. Because in the Bible, the Bible is a realistic book of real families living out real life and having real problems and really struggling at times to make things work. If you look at Abraham, the father of the faith, this guy, when he's under pressure, he has a tendency to lie. And then his son, Isaac, does the same thing. When he's under pressure trying to save his skin, he does the very same thing, he lies. And they have offspring, and that's where Jacob comes in, and Jacob is the biggest liar and trickster of them all. And you just find this dysfunction going from one generation to the next. And I believe, friends, that it will continue on in your family or my family until we say, enough is enough. No more, no more, no more. You will not control my family by things of the past. That's where the Bible says the sins of the fathers are visited upon the second, third, and even fourth generation. We have a tendency to live with the same Sin habits is the previous generations. And so King David, he knows what it's like to have a family in such disarray. And so he writes these words, how good. And he's thinking about his own family. He is thinking about, of course, the family of God and the bigger picture, but he's thinking first and foremost about how good and pleasant it would have been for our family to dwell together in unity. Absalom, Amnon, the Bible says that the sword tragically never left the house of David. It's no wonder then that David, when he writes, behold how good and pleasant it is, there's a cry inside of his heart saying, not only for my family, but for your family and for the family of God, live together in unity, it's good. You see, God desires that his family be a unified body. Unity is only possible, however, with an agreed upon agenda. How many of you have ever been to, uh, let's just say, go to the state fair? And when you go to the state fair, I mean, I love going to the fair. And my idea of going to the fair is you eat your way through the fair. You start out with, you know, a good brat, and then you go over to the corn, you know, and they've got the fresh corn that's been grilled, and then you go over and get cheese curds, and then you try out some ice cream, and you go over to the dairy, you know, section, and you just, gar- you know, just gorge yourself all the way through, all right? And then you pray and ask for forgiveness afterwards. <laughs> and pray that all those calories will not attach to your body. And I've gone to the fair with others where all they wanted to do is go look at the animals. And it's like, I didn't come here for that. (laughs) There ain't no way we're ever going to be buds for life. (laughs) Or if you go to a museum, and I love going to, you know, the great museums in Washington, D.C. And when I get there and you go over to the Smithsonian, my wife wants to go to where they've got all the gowns from all of the presidential, you know, inaugurations. And she, she can stand there and just look at them. And, and I'm thinking, oh boy. <laughs> Come with me over to the Aerospace Museum. And now we're talking. I'll show you, you know, aircraft from way back. I'll show you the first jet engine. And I'll show you the rocket that took man to the moon and, you know, the lunar lander and, you know, the, all the miracles. Of the, and she, she looks at me like, let's go look at a dress. <clears throat> so I think we've all either been to a fair, we've gone to a museum, we've gone somewhere with someone, only to find that because we were not united on what we wanted to see and what we wanted to accomplish, It was just kind of a frustrating thing. And so ultimately in those moments, generally what happens, honey, I'll tell you what, you go over and enjoy the dresses, I'm gonna go over to the space and I'll meet you for lunch. 
and we kind of all go our separate ways. Anybody identify? You know what I'm talking about, okay? The Bible says how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. This unity is only possible if we have a united mission in mind, an agreed upon agenda. Amos in chapter three and verse three says this, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Can you walk with somebody, one is leaving the parking lot here and wants to go to uh, South Milwaukee and another one wants to go to New Berlin? You can't do so. You'll always then be pulling apart and being separated. And that, dear friends, I want you to understand, the spiritual sense as it relates to the church as well as to your family. There's nothing more than the enemy would love to see is divide because he knows in dividing he can conquer. And he knows that in the conquering, he's conquering the mission. You see, I am convinced that every family has a mission. And I believe that God placed you in a physical, natural family, and there's a calling upon that family's life. There is a plan of God, but there's also a plan of God for this family joined here the, this morning at 7311 South 13th Street, and how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, and that's only possible when we agree upon the agenda. I remind you that Absalom was part of the royal family, yet he had his own personal agenda and he was willing to even take and kill his father to get his agenda across. Or what about Moses? Moses on the mountain speaking with God. Aaron, his buddy, his brother, fell prey to the personal agendas of man and builds the golden calf. You see, unity is only possible when there's agreement on the mission. Now here is our mission at Oak Creek Assembly of God. It is reaching our world for Christ as we lead individuals to discover and become who God has created them to be. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. David Wilkerson says there's only one prayer in the Bible by Jesus that has never been fully answered. And the answer to this one you'll find in John chapter 17 and verse 11. Here is the prayer that Jesus prayed. And this prayer is called his high priestly prayer. It is just before he is crucified and gives his life on Calvary. And here is what it says. I will remain in the world no longer he knows his time on earth has come to conclusion. But they are still in the world, referring to Peter and James and John and Matthew and all of these followers of his, not only the apostles, but all followers of his. I will not be in the world any longer, but they will still be in the world. I'm coming to you, Father. I'm coming home. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name the name that you gave me, so that they may be what? Say it. One. So these ragtag followers, these men that have been separate, you know, in their, their background, they had, one's a tax collector, others are fishermen, some we don't know, but nonetheless, they're all coming together. And he says, Father, I want you to work in their life so they may be one as we are one. Friends, I've come to see that unity is one of the primary works of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible tells us that 120 went to the upper room. It is likely that this 120, many of them may not have even known each other at all. Their reason for being there was obedience to their Lord, their Savior, Jesus, which told them, don't leave Jerusalem until you've been endowed with power from on high. And so this 120, this ragtag team is up there in the upper room, and the Bible says they were in one accord, in one place. They were in unity, one with another. They said, can you imagine being in a room with 120 people? Now, the size of the upper room I have been to the upper room. As a matter of fact, I'm leading a group back there in uh, February, February 25. 
we're going to be leaving. We're going to, but we'll go to what is traditionally the upper room. And uh, now we know it's a reproduction of that which was there because Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. But we can assume because of certain things, this would have been about the size. It would be like to be in uh, one of our classrooms down here, in uh, our C classrooms, and there's 120 of you in there. Day one comes by. You know, this guy didn't use deodorant. Day two, what's the last time you brushed your teeth, bro? Can you imagine? 10 days and they're still unified. 10 days. You see, their focus and their unity was based on the fact they were followers of Jesus Christ. And because we're followers of Jesus Christ, you don't stink, you just smell unique. <laughs> You're my brother. You're my sister. And we're here together because he is commissioning us. And that ragtag, unconnected team of 120 that went to the upper room came down as one church united and filled with the Spirit of God. You know, unity is such a marvelous thing. Unity brings great synergy to any work at all. Let me tell you a little bit about draft horses. A draft horse, and you've all seen these big old, these monster of a horse, these draft horses that pull, you know, wagons, they can pull, you know, one bottom, two bottom plow, and so on. One draft horse can pull approximately 2,500 pounds. And if you will team them together, two of them will be capable of pulling 9,000. Notice, you would say, well, if one can pull 2,500, two should be able to pull how much? 5,000, but it's almost double. And if you were to take and hitch four of them together, the synergy of the four, the four will pull right in the neighborhood of about 30,000 pounds. That's why the enemy wants to separate us. Because of the synergy and the strength and the power, when a church rises up and said, I know our mission. Our mission is to seek and to save the lost. Our mission was the last commission. In Matthew chapter 28, take a look at it. Put it on the screens for you. Matthew chapter 28. It tells us there in verse 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Now let me just, once again, this as Jesus is just about to ascend up. They're on the Mount of Ascension. This is the last command. This is the last word given to them. And Jesus said, now let me make sure you guys know so that you don't get messed up on what the mission ought to be. Because unless you agree on the mission, you're going to be all separated doing different things. But let me show you what the mission is. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Notice the nations. I am so glad this church is not only touching Oak Creek, and South Milwaukee, and Cudahy, and uh, Greendale, and Greenfield, and you know, the, 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 the cities round about, and Racine, and all the way down to Kenosha, and all the way out to the west, to all the Berlin areas, and Waukesha, and beyond, and all the way up to Fox Point, and beyond. All of these, I'm glad we're reaching all of this, but friends, I want you to know, your footprint is reaching now all over the globe. The sun never sets on the ministry of this church, and you are part of what God is doing. And God is pleased when we work together, and he's pleased when we unite together, and that we agree upon the mission, and the mission is to do that which he's told us to do. Go ye therefore into all the world, or into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. 
And the Bible tells us how he ascended up. And the disciples were gazing at the high, highest heavens. Wow. He's gone. And while they're still staring upward, the Bible says two dressed like what we can assume to be angels came and stood by them and said, you men of Galilee, why do you stand there gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up from you shall come again in like manner. Get out there and get the job done. And the church went, and the Bible says they went everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming his word with signs following. We believe in a dynamic lifestyle of worship. We believe our relationships are called by God, chosen by God. They're covenant relationships, that God is our Father. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are part of the family of God. And as a part of the family of God, we grab a hold of the same mission because we understand that we can do more when we labor together than we'll ever accomplish alone. And if, you know, draft horses have that kind of a multiplier, Think what happens when we begin to focus on what God has called us to do. Now, don't get over, what should I say? Don't be taken away by the fact that there's 8 billion people in the world. You know, the world is never any bigger than the person you're looking in the eye. Whoever you're looking at at that moment, that becomes the world. And it's no bigger than that. And sometimes we get fogged out. We start thinking of 8 billion. What are we going to do with 8 billion? And we forget about the one we're looking in the eye. Let me encourage you. Love one another. When differences come, settle those things. Because we believe in a dynamic lifestyle of worship. We believe in relationships that are devoted to unity. And unity can only happen when you agree on the mission. And the mission is not the mission of the Assemblies of God. It's not the mission of Oak Creek Assembly of God. It was a mission given to us. And the mission given to us by Jesus Christ himself is to go into all the world, take this gospel to everyone, everywhere. And I'm so glad you're my brother. You're my sister, and we can do this together. Amen, church? We believe in the dream.